Good morning. We begin business today with uh, general questions. The first question from Daniel Johnson. I ask the Scottish Government how many uh, remand and how many sentence prisoners have been sent to HMYOI Pullman since 2013 due to space being unavailable at secure care units? Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. Uh, in relation to solemn proceedings, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in relation to solemn proceedings, there have been none. Uh, local authorities, of course, are responsible for remand uh, and summary proceedings, and the Scottish Government uh, doesn't hold information on those particular cases. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but given that we are now a month on from the tragic circumstances uh, of William Lindsay's death, I do find it surprising that the Scottish Government does not know the number uh, in question, because I think it is vital that we understand this so that we can put right what tragically went wrong. So can I ask what the government is going to do to find out what the figure is and then what ultimately we'll do to put right the circumstances that surrounded that death, because ultimately I think that is what is required. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say a couple of things? Uh, in, in relation to his first question, my answer was that we don't hold that information uh, on record because it is local authorities' responsibility. It is something, of course, I can approach local authorities uh, to, to, to ask them about. But what I would say is we have to be really careful when talking about uh, any incident. Uh, if I take the case that the member referenced in terms of William Lindsay's own case, it would be incorrect, it would not be factual, to say that there wasn't secure unit space available at the time of William Lindsay's case on the 3rd uh, and the 4th of October. Uh, my understanding, the information that I have, is that there was secure unit availability. Now, that would have been for the local authority and the social work department in particular, but the local authority uh, to, of course, have found that out uh, and to present that to the court at the time. In terms of what we're doing, the Deputy First Minister and I are working extremely closely because there is an issue around secure unit availability, the fact that uh, if that is not up to a certain level of capacity, then those secure units could potentially close and none of us would want that. So we are working on options. In fact, I've seen options presented to me and to the Deputy First Minister just this week. Uh, and of course, I will keep the member and others updated uh, to when we get to what I would think is a more satisfactory, satisfactory position uh, in this regard. Annie Wells. It's estimated that 70% of those in prison have a mental health problem. In a report by the Health and Sport Committee last year on healthcare in prisons, it was noted that there is a considerable variation across prisons in relation to mental health care available. What action has been taken by the Scottish Government to ensure that prisoners no matter where they have been sentenced, are able to access mental health support that best fits their needs. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Annie Wells for, for asking that question? It's hugely, hugely important. I've visited uh, prisons uh, across the prison estate. I'll continue to visit uh, more prisons in the prison estate. And mental health and the addressing of mental health is absolutely the core uh, of what is provided. But I don't doubt at all that we can go further uh, and that more can be done. Uh, and this is uh, in a variety of settings. Uh, we know that, for example, when it comes to female offenders, that mental health issues present themselves even more than they do in amongst the male population. But in amongst the male population, uh, there are mental health issues. We have, of course, uh, when it comes to young people, the Talk to Me strategy also. Uh, as you'll know from my answer that I gave previously, uh, looking at the issues in a Pullman, uh, we have instructed uh, a review of mental health services in amongst Pullman, because, again, we're not satisfied uh, that we are uh, at the best place possible. So we'll continue to work with SPS, with the NHS, of course, who provide uh, services, uh, but where we can learn best practice elsewhere, then this government absolutely is open-minded to make sure that we're tackling mental health issues, uh, whether they're uh, in the prison estate or indeed out with. Question number two, Miles Briggs. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on a feasibility study being carried out to address congestion on the Edinburgh City Bypass. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises the important role that the A720 plays for Edinburgh and its region and the national economy. Transport Scotland is currently uh, monitoring the queuing on this particular route and investigating how this can be better managed. Additionally, Transport Scotland is undertaking a second strategic transport project review. Uh, this will be a multimodal review and will consider the performance of the A720. Uh, we have uh, committed to taking this forward in a collaborative fashion, uh, which will provide a robust evidence base to support future decisions on investment in strategic transport infrastructure across Scotland for the next 20 years. 
Miles Briggs. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It's clear that we need to see work commence now to take forward a long-term solution and to, to address the constant gridlock on the A7. Can I therefore ask the Minister if he'd be willing uh, for the Scottish Government also to commit to a feasibility study and will he agree to meet with representatives from across the area as I know this is a growing problem for all of us across this Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the President officer, President officer, the member may be interested to know that the uh, Strategic Transport Project Review will consider the entirety of the A720 uh, and that work will start next year, uh, which will be informed by the National Transport Strategy, which is due to be published at the end of uh, next year. Uh, the STPR2 uh, will allow us to set out what the strategic investment decisions will be uh, for our transport infrastructure uh, over the course of the next 20 years, uh, including uh, making that assessment of the A7 at uh, So the very process that the member is making reference to is facilitated through the STPR uh, process. And I would encourage those who have an interest in that matter to engage in that process once it's been undertaken by Transport Scotland. Question number three, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many businesses in the Stirling constituency have been lifted out of paying non-domestic rates under the Small Business Bonus Scheme. Minister Kate Forbes. Information on the Small Business Bonus Scheme is not currently available by parliamentary constituency, but as at 1st of June 2018, 2,670 business properties in the Stirling local authority area were lifted out of paying rates through the Small Business Bonus Scheme. Since the Small Business Bonus Scheme was introduced by this government, it has saved premises in Stirling nearly £39 million. Bruce Crawford. Well, that's very good information from the Minister. I wonder, in addition, we should, can, you, can you tell us how much uh, small businesses in my constituency will save next year as a result of the SNP government's budget that delivers the best budget package for small businesses anywhere in the UK? A budget that, incredibly, the Tories have already said, including Dean Lockhart, who are sees here today, they will vote against. Minister. Well, I share the member's incredulity that the Tories might be considering to vote against something that saves businesses um, so much in hard cash. And spend on the Small Business Bonus Scheme was £5.8 million in 2018-19 in the Stirling Local Authority area. And since the scheme was introduced by the government, it has saved premises a whopping £38.9 million in this area. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Government's figures released two weeks ago show that more than 1,200 businesses, large and small, across the Stirling area have waited over 18 months for the outcome of their appeals against punishing rate increases. For many, the outcome of their appeal will be the difference between staying in business or being forced to close and lay off staff. If, like me, the Minister finds this situation unacceptable, what measures will she take to address it? Minister. Well, I thank the member for that question and on two points. On the first, in terms of appeals, one of the recommendations in the Barclay Review, which we have accepted in full and which I'm taking forward as part of primary legislation next year, um, as well as um, other uh, guidance support, is to make sure that the appeals process works for businesses and make sure that it puts justice at the heart of businesses and businesses that need access to justice can get it. But what Dean Lockhart doesn't uh, acknowledge either is that in the Stirling area, not only are more businesses in receipt of the, something like the Small Business Bonus Scheme, but the overall value that that is ensuring that businesses save as part of the Small Business Bonus Scheme is directly contributing to business growth in that area. Question number four, Gordon Lindhurst. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with developing a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship scheme to boost exports alongside CBI Scotland. Minister Ivan McKee. The Minister launched the Export Challenge on 26 November this year, an event attended by around 100 businesses from across Scotland who have shown support and interest in the challenge. Good progress has been made in developing the detail of the programme and we're working closely with partners including CBI Scotland and Scottish Development International to ensure its successful implementation and I would like to take this opportunity to encourage businesses to feel that they would benefit from being mentored or who are experienced exporters and would like to participate as a mentor to volunteer for consideration to take part in the programme. Gordon Linters. Um, in a recent policy paper, CBI Scotland outlined a number of measures the Scottish Government can take to support Scottish businesses to export. 
Uh, some of these recommendations include addressing the falling number of students passing foreign language exams, making up the shortfall in STEM subject uptake, and looking at whether secondary, further, or higher education could offer opportunities to study commercial international trade. Does the minister agree that improving our children's education in these areas is key to growing exports? And has he discussed these matters specifically with the education secretary? Ivan McKee. Um, the, 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 I, I can understand the point that the member is making and I undertake to, uh, to have a, a conversation and take those matters up with uh, my colleagues, uh, the education minister, to, uh, to discuss that. Um, clearly, that's one aspect and that's part of um, the overall approach that we need to be, need to be looking at. Question number five, Monica Lennon. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the procedures used by the Public Defence Solicitor's Office and the Scottish Legal Aid Board to investigate workplace bullying and harassment. Minister Ash Denham. The Scottish Government has a zero tolerance to any form of bullying, harassment and discrimination from any source and where it occurs it's essential that it gets reported and tackled. It's for the Scottish Government in overseeing the work of public bodies to promote diversity and help create an open culture which will increase the likelihood of individuals speaking up about any wrongdoing. As the Scottish Legal Aid Board is a non-departmental public body, staff are employed directly by the organisation. All public bodies must have their own robust grievance policies and procedures in place, and the Scottish Government requires these grievance policies and procedures to comply with appropriate employment legislation, that they are accessible, that they are clearly understood by staff, and importantly, that staff know how to access and use them. The Scottish Government also provides a model code of conduct for staff of public bodies and SLAB have <coughs> confirmed that it complies with this model. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for her reply. Kerry Evans is a lawyer in the Public Defence Solicitor's Office. Kerry is deeply unhappy with the way SLAB have handled her claims of bullying by her line manager. As reported in the Sunday Mail, um, the Scottish Legal Aid Board gave Kerry's personal diary about alleged incidents in her workplace to her line manager without her knowledge. The Information Commissioner has said this was a breach of data protection obligations. I understand other concerns about bullying at this public agency have been raised. Will the Minister take this seriously and request an independent investigation of this case and make sure that staff have full confidence in the policies and procedures that are in place? Minister. Let me assure the Chamber that while Scottish Ministers have no mechanism to intervene or to comment on any individual or current cases, the Scottish Government is working to tackle and to challenge the underlying attitudes and inequalities that perpetuate this kind of behaviour, and I'm sure that the Member would accept that. But on the particular case, um, the Chief Executive has confirmed that an independent and external organisation with expertise in employment law, HR, and health and safety matters was commissioned specifically to review the circumstances and the organization's policies and procedures for handling such matters. The chief executive has confirmed that relevant policies and procedures will be reviewed and updated in light of the recommendations from the external review and I expect to be kept updated on any developments by the chair of the board. The right to privacy is very important and public bodies are responsible for ensuring that they adhere to data protection laws and the information commissioner's office is responsible for that regulation. The Scottish Government, I'm sure the member will understand, cannot comment on this particular case, which relates to an ongoing grievance. Thank you. Question six has not been lodged. Question seven, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the United Nations regarding proposals to raise the internationally advised minimum age of criminal responsibility to 14. Minister Marie Todd. The UNCRC is consulting on its draft revised general comment number 10 to seek views on its proposal to advise a minimum age of criminal responsibility of 14. No final decision has been made and we will of course consider the views of the UN committee once a final version of the revised general comment has been received. To date we have had no discussions with the UN committee. We were contacted by the UK government on 11th of December 2018 regarding the response to this consultation and we will provide our contribution in due course. 
Alice Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful to the Minister for that answer. Fewer than 712 and 13 year olds are referred to the children's reporter on offence grounds each year. A further half dozen are referred to criminal courts. These are not significant numbers, but the impact of a criminal record on life chances for any young person is significant. It is traumatic and it is lifelong. It's why the Children's Reporters Administration told the Human Rights Committee at stage one of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill that there was an imperative to go further than 12 in setting out our new ACR. So can I ask the Minister, given that the UN will likely raise the internationally prescribed minimum age of criminal responsibility to 14 in February, does she share my concern that the bill will be out of date before its ink is even dry? Minister. The Scottish Government absolutely recognises and respects the significance of the UN Committee's general comments as an aid to interpreting the Convention. We are committed to respecting and protecting human rights. We consider the recommendations by international organisations very closely in our policy making and we seek to uphold the very highest standards of children's rights in a responsible and in an appropriate way. In Scotland's case, the age of criminal responsibility has to be looked at within the context of our unique children's hearing system. The children's hearing system provides a distinct welfare-led alternative to criminal procedure for the vast majority of children under 16. Raising the age of criminal responsibility must be looked at in the wider context of current approaches. Um, and we should all acknowledge the government's willingness, the government's record in this area and its willingness to bring forward further reform in Scotland. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. While we believe that 12 strikes the right balance, can the Minister confirm if she was aware that the UN were considering raising their recommended age of criminal responsibility before uh, she introduced the bill uh, and gave evidence to the committee at stage one? Minister. The Scottish Government was made aware of the consultation on the 14th of November 2018, the day after the Scottish Parliament's day one, stage one debate on the age of criminal responsibility. Thank you. Question eight, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the clear-up rate for housebreakings is. Minister Cabinet Secretary, Hamza Yusuf. Clear-up rate for housebreaking was 23.9% in 17-18. Uh, that was up from 22.5% in the previous year. Uh, this has remained at similar levels over the last decade. Uh, since the advent of devolution, the number of housebreakings recorded by the police fell by 73% to their lowest level since comparable records began. Liam Kerr. <coughs> Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, which, phrased a little more bluntly, confirms that over three quarters of housebreakings in Scotland go unsolved and unpunished under the SNP. This is a disgrace. Uh, when did the Cabinet Secretary last meet the Chief Constable specifically to discuss this issue? C Cabinet Secretary. Well, Chief Constable and I obviously meet on a regular occasion and discuss uh, how we can improve uh, safety and, 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 of course, uh, when it comes to issues of housebreaking, again, that is something that I talk about regularly uh, with my officials and with the police. But I would say uh, on a serious point, of course, when it comes to clear-up lakes, we want to work to ensure that they are better, they are higher. Uh, but I would say the members should not ignore the fact that housebreakings have dramatically uh, fallen uh, with, uh, with the SNP in power. In fact, in the North East region, the one that the member... Uh, has an interest in, I'm sure, uh, they've fallen by 58% between 2008 and 9 and 2017 and 18. And the clear-up for housebreaking uh, in the North East has increased by 5% in the last year. So we are starting to improve. I agree with him that they should be higher and we will continue to work uh, with the police uh, to do that. But uh, I'm sure he would welcome uh, the, the fall in the housebreaking uh, over, over the last decade. Kenneth Gibson. Officer. Can the Minister uh, tell us how clear up figures for housebreaking in Scotland compared to England with the Tories in government? I understand that there it's less than 10 per cent. Cabinet Secretary <laughs> Hamza Yusuf. Uh, well, what I would say is, of course, uh, there are many comparisons to make with England and Wales. We have seen a reduction. Uh, of course, of housebreakings, and in fact, in England and Wales, there has been an increase in housebreaking. Now, that might be in part because in Scotland we have invested in our police officers and our police service. We have, for example, in Scotland, awarded a 6.5% pay increase, while in England and Wales, the police service are taking the UK government to court because they won't pay them the appropriate uh, amount. And of course, in Scotland, since the SNP has been in power, we've increased police numbers uh, to, to record levels, to 913 more than we inherited. 
and in England and Wales they've fallen by almost 20,000. A terrible indictment, of course, of the UK Tory government. So, uh, therefore, of course, that is why we are seeing uh, housebreakings reduced in Scotland, whereas we are seeing them increase uh, in England and Wales. So we'll continue to invest in our police officers, continue to make sure Scotland is kept safe, and we'll leave uh, the Conservatives uh, to cart from a sedentary position.